Blood flow and pressure is the topic of the screencast. You may find this topic in chapter 11 of your textbook. The screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Define systolic, diastolic, and pulse pressure. Describe pulse. Describe the pressure of blood as it passes through the systemic circulation. Use an equation to explain the effects of cardiac output, peripheral resistance, and arterial blood volume on blood pressure. Explain in detail how the barometric reflex maintains short-term blood pressure homeostasis. List the values for optimum systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And lastly, describe how a spingle manometer is used to determine blood pressure. Now the heart does not actually pump blood or push blood all the way through the cardiovascular system. If it did, the thin walled capillaries would literally blow out because remember the walls of the capillaries are one cell layer thick and they wouldn't be able to withstand that type of pressure. Also, blood flow would stop every time the ventricles relaxed. And of course, we know that blood moves continuously. Instead of pumping blood completely through the cardiovascular system, the heart maintains a blood pressure gradient from high to low, which allows blood to move from high pressure to low pressure. Blood moves from the ventricle to artery, artery to capillaries, capillaries to veins, and then veins back to the heart, the atria specifically, always moving down its pressure gradient. So as the ventricles contract, they force blood into the arteries, the arteries stretch out and act as a bellows, while the ventricles relax and begin filling for the next contraction, the arteries recoil. Systolic pressure is the peak pressure developed in the aorta and large arteries coming off the left ventricle during ventricular systole, that is, when the ventricles are contracting. The lowest pressure produced in the aorta and the large arteries is during ventricular diastole or when the ventricles are relaxing, and that is referred to as diastolic pressure. Taking the average of systolic and diastolic pressure gives you the mean arterial pressure, or MAP. The clinical significance of this number is that uh, a MAP of 60 millimeters of mercury or higher is thought to be required to maintain blood flow to organs. If the MAP drops below 60 millimeters of mercury, tissues of organs can become ischemic. Pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. The pulse pressure creates a pressure wave that travels through the arteries like a wave of water on a lake. This is your pulse, which you feel on your body at locations called pressure points where superficial arteries are found. Since pulse pressure is produced with each ventricular systole, we use the pulse to measure heart rate. The more commonly used pressure points include the radial artery of the wrist and the carotid artery of the neck. This figure illustrates pressure in the systemic circulation. Locations within the systemic circulation are shown on the x-axis starting with the left ventricle and ending with the right ventricle. Pressure in millimeters of mercury is shown on the y-axis. Notice that in the left ventricle, pressure drops almost to zero during ventricular diastole, but pressure drops far less in the arteries that receive blood from the left ventricle. This is due to semilunar valves, which help maintain pressure. Systolic pressure is illustrated by the orange dotted line, and the green dotted line illustrates diastolic pressure. 
notice that pulse pressure is not detectable beyond the arterioles. Most importantly, notice that there is a general decline in blood pressure as blood passes through the systemic circulations, especially in the arterioles. Do you have any idea as to why this is the case? Well, as arteries continually branch into greater and greater numbers of arteries, surface area increases. Pressure, by definition, is the amount of force exerted per unit of area. Force is constant, but area is increasing as the arteries branch into greater and greater numbers of arteries. So as the surface area increases, there is less and less force exerted per unit of area. Therefore, blood pressure declines. Notice particularly that pressure is very low, extremely low, in the veins, and there's not much of a pressure gradient to move blood through the veins back to the heart. That's why having valves, muscular pumps and respiratory pumps to move blood through the veins back to the heart are so important. Blood pressure must be tightly regulated at all times. If blood pressure is too low, there is not sufficient pressure gradient to supply tissues with adequate blood flow, resulting in tissue death. If, on the other hand, pressure is too high, blood vessels can be damaged. Two main factors are the major determinants of blood pressure. Compliance is the ability of arteries to stretch as arterial blood volume increases. This allows arteries to receive greater amounts of blood with minimum impact on blood pressure. As arterial blood volume increases, this also increases blood pressure. Just as pressure in a tire increases as more air fills the tire, or pressure in a water balloon increases as more and more water is added to the balloon. Arterial blood volume is affected by total blood volume since it represents 13% of total blood volume. Now the kidneys regulate total blood volume over the long term and therefore regulate blood pressure over the long term. We'll talk more about the role that the kidneys play in long term regulation of blood pressure when we cover urinary system in chapter 16. However, the body can regulate arterial blood volume and therefore uh, pressure in the short term, that is minute to minute, by altering the percentage of total blood volume in the arteries. The greater the arterial blood volume, the greater the blood pressure, the lower the arterial blood volume, the lower the pressure. So we said that compliance and arterial blood volume were the main determinants of blood pressure. Well, since compliance only changes due to disease, short-term control of blood pressure must be through control of arterial blood volume. Arterial blood volume can be controlled by altering the volume of blood entering the arteries or cardiac output and by altering the amount of blood leaving the arteries through the arterioles. The impact of arterial blood volume on blood pressure is illustrated by this figure from your book. At the top we have an illustration of a lower blood pressure. Let's say that the body, for whatever reason, wants to increase blood pressure by increasing cardiac output while at the same time 
increasing resistance provided by the arterioles, there will be an increase in arterial blood volume. This increase in arterial blood volume will lead to an increase in blood pressure. If there was a need to lower blood pressure, a decrease in cardiac output while at the same time decreasing resistance provided by the arterioles with lower blood pressure. Thus the body has a very effective means by which to regulate blood pressure in the short term by regulating arterial blood volume. The effects of arterial volume on blood pressure result in the following equation. Blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance. To understand how the autonomic nervous system maintains short-term blood pressure homeostasis, commit this equation to memory. Baroreceptors, these are pressure receptors, in the aorta and carotid arteries respond to changes in blood pressure. Sensory autonomic neurons then conduct nerve impulses from the baroreceptors to the vasomotor center of the brainstem. Autonomic motor neurons of the vasomotor center then send motor output to the heart and arterioles, which make adjustments to maintain blood pressure homeostasis. To further understand how the autonomic nervous system maintains blood pressure homeostasis, let's examine how this feedback loop functions when a serious bleed reduces blood pressure. The baroreceptor reflex is an autonomic reflex that helps maintain blood pressure homeostasis. So the situation is, in this figure, we have an individual that has sustained a pretty severe injury and has lost a lot of blood. The loss of blood reduces arterial blood volume, which results in a decrease in blood pressure. In the carotid arteries and the aorta, there are baroreceptors. These are receptors that detect a drop in pressure. As pressure drops, there is less stretching of the walls of the carotid artery and aorta, and in response, these baroreceptors send fewer action potentials to the vasomotor center located in the brainstem. With fewer action potentials being received, the vasomotor center increases sympathetic motor nerve activity and decreases parasympathetic motor nerve activity. This impacts both the heart as well as the arterioles. Sympathetic activation increases heart rate by accelerating the depolarization of the SA node. There is also an increase in stroke volume by increasing the contraction strength of the ventricular cells. The net result is an increase in cardiac output. The arterioles also respond by contracting their smooth muscles, constricting their lumen, and therefore increasing peripheral resistance. With an increase in cardiac output and an increase in peripheral resistance, there is an increase in blood pressure, hopefully restoring blood pressure to the normal range. I want to be clear that not all arterioles constrict in response to sympathetic stimulation. Only arterioles that feed non-vital tissues such as the skin and muscle. Arterioles to such vital organs as the brain and heart never constrict. So the net result is a shift in blood flow from organs like the skin and muscles to organs like the heart and brain when blood pressure falls. The vasomotor center of the baroreceptor reflex also responds to elevated blood pressure. 
baroreceptors send more action potentials to the vasomotor center. In response, the vasomotor center decreases sympathetic activity and increases parasympathetic activity. Heart rate and contractility of the ventricles decreases, which decreases cardiac output. Concurrently, arterioles dilate, which decreases peripheral resistance. The net effect is a reduction in blood pressure toward the normal range. Optimum blood pressure is 120 over 80, 120 being systolic and 80 being diastolic. And the systolic reading always precedes the diastolic reading. Hypertension is a sustained elevation in blood pressure. An individual is considered pre-hypertensive if they have persistent blood pressure readings in excess of 120 over 80, but below 140 over 90. If you exceed 140 over 90, you are considered hypertensive. Hypertension is often called the silent killer because while your blood pressure is elevated, you may feel fine, you may be able to carry on normally. All the while, damage is being done slowly over time to various organs of the body, including the kidneys, blood vessels, and other important organs. Ten years later, you have a stroke, heart attack, or kidney failure. That's why it is so important to monitor one's blood pressure and if one is found to be hypertensive or even or even pre-hypertensive for some medical treatment to begin because over time hypertension can do serious damage to organs of the body. Given the importance of blood pressure, let's talk about how it is measured. So you're all familiar with the looks, anyway, of a sphingomanometer. You may not have known the name, but you're familiar with this apparatus. It's shown here on the left. It's used to monitor blood pressure. It consists of a pressure cuff, a hand inflator, as well as a pressure gauge that lets you know the amount of pressure being exerted by the cuff. Typically, this cuff is wrapped around the brachial region of the body, and it is inflated until blood flow through the brachial artery is cut off completely. A stethoscope is placed below the cuff to listen for any blood moving through the brachial artery. When the cuff is first inflated, there should be no sounds as there should be no blood moving through the brachial artery. Pressure is then slowly released from the pressure cuff until pressure falls to the systolic blood pressure. At that point, there will be some movement, some turbulent flow of blood through the brachial artery, and you can hear this using the stethoscope. It is at that point that one marks systolic pressure. You will then continue to release pressure from the cuff until the brachial artery is completely open and you can no longer hear any sounds. It is at that point that you mark the diastolic blood pressure. Although determination of blood pressure using a sphingomanometer seems quite simple, and honestly it is, uh, it is quite effective and quite accurate in determining one's blood pressure. Now let's review the objectives of the screencast. Define systolic, diastolic, and pulse pressure. Describe pulse. Describe the pressure of blood as it passes through the systemic circulation. Use an equation to explain the effects of cardiac output, peripheral resistance, and arterial blood volume on blood pressure.
Explain in detail how the barometric reflex maintains short-term blood pressure homeostasis. List the values for optimum systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And lastly, describe how a sphingomanometer manometer is used to determine blood pressure. Blood flow and blood pressure is the topic of the next screencast.